Hello and welcome to this session. In today's lecture, I'll talk about Jane Austen's persuasion and I will do a close reading of the chapters and through that close reading, I will try to connect elements of the novel with the larger ideological issues that were circulating in the 19th century. This is the title page of uh, Persuasion, which was published with Northanger Abbey. So this came out in 1818. And as you can see that there is no mention of Jane Austen's name there on the title page. Now, the book begins with a reference to another book, uh, which is called Baronetage. And this book is about a record of all the nobility and um, their descendants uh, and heirs and who married whom. So this book contains a list of all the members of the nobility. And it is this book which fascinates Sir Walter Elliot. And whenever he is uh, a bit um, lost for time, whenever he is a bit um, preoccupied, whenever he is a bit worried, he would uh, find occupation for an idle hour in uh, this book called Baronetage. And uh, in fact, even when he is distressed, he would find consolation in this particular uh, book about nobility. And the particular page uh, that he is um, most interested in is his own history, uh, which talks about uh, his lineage and his heirs, um, uh, his family, his daughters, and the, uh, and the man who is going to inherit his property. So this book is an indication of the position of uh, Sir Walter Elliot's class position and it also reinforces the fact that he is from the nobility and um, the other most significant uh, uh, point about uh, this book is uh, an uh, indication of um, Sir Walter Elliot's vanity. This book tells us that he is very, very vain because as you can uh, see that he is preoccupied with his own interest. And the narrator, the third person narrator, very clearly spells out uh, what kind of a man Sir Walter Elliot was. Vanity was the beginning and the end of Sir Walter Elliot's character, vanity of person and of situation. So he was both vain about his personality um, as well as of his situation, his class position which is that of a baronet. So he is vain about these two things, his attractive uh, figure as well as his high uh, rank in society. He considered the blessing of beauty as inferior only to the blessing of a baronetcy. And the Sir Walter Elliot who united these gifts was the constant object of his warmest respect and devotion. So uh, Sir Walter Elliot considered uh, beauty to be only uh, next in importance to the idea of a high position. And the person who combined both these merits um, was the uh, object of his own uh, admiration and fascination and that person is he himself. So he is that kind of uh, a vain man. And this is the illustration of Sir Walter Elliot by C. E. Brock and it's a watercolor illustration and this is the uh, biographical detail of Charles Edmund Brock and he was an English painter, line artist and book illustrator. And uh, if you look at the small note there, uh, which says few women could think more of their personal appearance than he did. So this is an, uh, a quotation. This is a quotation from the novel. And that tells you uh, the kind of man Sir Walter Elliot is and how much importance he places on his personal appearance. Now, here is a, a quick question for you. Uh, in terms of the dysfunctional families that you can see uh, uh, referred to in the beginning of the novel, how many can you list? 
um, I can easily tell you that Sir Walter's family is also a dysfunctional family and um, another dysfunctional uh, family could be Lady Russell's. Uh, even though she is a widow, uh, she doesn't have any children, she doesn't remarry, she doesn't seem to have any close relatives. So uh, you can see that that family is also very incomplete and Sir Walter's family is again slightly dysfunctional and you would see uh, in what way that is quite shortly. Now we have another figure who is introduced at the beginning of the novel which uh, who is Mrs. Clay and she is the daughter of Mr. Shepherd uh, who has returned home with the additional burden of two children. So Mrs. Clay has been separated from her husband and she has come home after an uh, unprosperous marriage and she is spending time with uh, Elspeth Elliot, who is the uh, eldest daughter of uh, Sir Walter Elliot. So you can see that once again there is another dysfunctional family. in uh, Mrs. Clay who has come home with her two children who is seen as a burden uh, by the society which is what um, the third person narrator communicates uh, in this particular uh, narrative about Mrs. Clay. So already you can uh, get a sense that there are three dysfunctional families. Uh, the first one is Sir Walter Elliot who is a widower um, and who has three daughters and then uh, we can sense that Lady Russell who spends quite a bit of time um, in association with the Elliot family, she also seems to be slightly dysfunctional in that she doesn't have any family at all. I mean she uh, uh, is the representative of her family uh, in fact and then we have Mrs. Clay. The narrator says that she was a clever young woman who understood the art of pleasing, the art of pleasing at least at Kellynch Hall and who had made herself so acceptable to Miss Elliot as to have been already staying there more than once. So Mrs. Clay spends quite a bit of time at Kellynch Hall which is the family estate. of the Elliots. So there is a big country estate at the heart of this novel and that is uh, Kellynch Hall and in this Kellynch Hall we have in re residence the Elliots, um, so Walter Elliot and then we have uh, Elspeth Elliot and Anne Elliot. Mary Musker has been married off to a neighboring squire's son so she is not in residence but the Elliots, uh, the majority of them live at Kellynch Hall and we have Mrs. Clay spending quite a bit of time as the companion of the eldest Miss Elliot and the narrator very subtly tells us that she knows the art of pleasing. Mrs. Clay knows the art of pleasing. So we need to uh, ask this question, whom does she please? She obviously pleases uh, El uh, Elizabeth Elliot, but whom else does she please? And uh, the narrator also tells us that she is a clever young woman. So she is uh, single right now and she's very clever and she has attached herself to this rich uh, um, you know, family, uh, at least a, a family which is of high status if not exactly rich. We will come to the financial uh, aspect of the Elliots quite shortly. Now Elizabeth Elliot is introduced uh, by the narrator and um, the narrator says that she had had a disappointment which that book and especially the history of her own family must um, ever present the remembrance of. Uh, the book that is referred to here is the Baronetage that the father is quite uh, fascinated by and um, the narrator says that the book is a constant reminder of a particular disappointment and that disappointment is disappointment in love. Um, so why is she disappointed? Um, she hasn't found a man to marry, a man uh, suitable for her to marry and the book doesn't record her marriage. This is one thing but more than that there is a specific disappointment uh, in the sense that um, since Sir Walter Elliot doesn't have a male heir, the country estate is entailed to uh, another uh, relative who is called um, 
William Elliot. So William Elliot uh, was encouraged to uh, be, you know, uh, fascinated by Elizabeth Elliot. Um, you know, the family wanted them to marry, especially Sir Walter Elliot and Elizabeth Elliot uh, wanted. Um, William Elliot to be interested in this uh, eldest daughter of um, the Kellynch uh, family, but then uh, he disappoints her. He doesn't marry Elizabeth Elliot. In fact, he marries another woman, uh, a rich woman, but uh, uh, from a very inferior social position. So whenever she looks at this history, she can see that there is no record of her own marriage. And more than that, she can see the name of the man whom she was supposed to marry whom she intended to marry but again he also disappointed her so there are uh, plenty of disappointments for Elizabeth Elliot in terms of the book and whenever she sees the book open in her home she just closes it uh, with a slight annoyance now who is this um, William Elliot he is um, usually referred to as Mr. Elliot in the book and he has studied uh, the law he's uh, extremely agreeable he's very very pleasant uh, to be with that's what um, the narrator uh, mentions and that's what was perceived of him at the beginning but instead of pushing his fortune in the line marked out for the heir of the house of Elliot, he had purchased independence by uniting himself to a rich woman of inferior birth. So uh, the Elliot family marks out a line for Mr. Elliot to follow, a path for Mr. Elliot to follow, but then he deviates from that path and marries another woman, a social inferior, and she happens to be rich too. Um, so this is what brings the disappointment for uh, Elizabeth Elliot and Sir Walter Elliot. And you can look at the metaphor uh, of commerce there in this particular excerpt, purchased metaphor of commerce, buying and selling, and then um, instead of pushing his fortune, instead of seeking his luck, he's supposed to seek his luck in, in a literal sense as well as in a, a figurative sense. Um, with this particular family, he has um, gone astray. While not towing the Elliot family um, need and demand is an offense is, is a is an of an unpleasant nature what he does which really pushes him outside of uh, the fold of the Elliot family is this he has spoken most disrespectfully of them all uh, most slightingly and contemptuously of the very blood he belonged to and the honors which were hereafter to be his own this could not be pardoned. So Mr. Elliot disappoints because he doesn't marry Elizabeth Elliot. He marries a uh, you know, socially inferior woman uh, uh, who is also rich. That's one uh, disappointment. But that disappointment could have been borne by the Elliot family if he had not attacked the dignity of the family name. And he has spoken most disrespectfully of them all, of all the Elliots. He has um, insulted them. He has been contemptuous of the very blood, the baronet blood. And the honors which were hereafter to be his own, what exactly are the honors? That is, he is going to acquire the property of Kellynch, or he is going to be the master of it. The property is entailed to him. So after the death of Sir Walter Elliot, the property will pass on to Mr. Elliot. So he has even spoken contemptuously of the heritage he is going to receive at some point. So this insult to the family name could not be pardoned by the Elliots of the Kellynch Hall. Now the narrator introduces um, a very important character, uh, a character with whom the entire plot is um, fascinated by. In fact, the entire story is, is about the fortunes of this young woman called Anne Elliot. Why is she introduced so late um, in the novel? 
and that in itself is very very interesting and that tells us something about uh, the kind of attitude the rest of the family have towards an alien she doesn't seem to be very important uh, in the scheme of things for this particular um, uh, Kellynch family now the question is this what are the details that suggest her inferior slash marginalized place among her society she is not often talked about by Sir Walter Elliot or by Elizabeth Elliot. Um, both of them, at the moment the novel begins, are interested in Mrs. Clay and, and in her company. The other very direct point that the narrator raises is this, Anne Elliot is no longer pretty. Her bloom had vanished early. She has lost her beauty quite early on. And we will know why she has lost her bloom uh, so early uh, in a short while. Even in its height, even when she was most pretty, even when she was most beautiful, her father had found little to admire in her. So totally different were her delicate features and mild dark eyes from his own. So he uh, doesn't like her so much, uh, even when she was very attractive. And the narrator offers um, a reason for this. Um, the narrator says that she was completely different uh, from her father in appearance. Her delicate features and mild dark eyes uh, were uh, not the uh, heritage of her father. In fact, we can assume that she resembles her mother more. So we can also um, tell that this is probably the reason that he uh, doesn't uh, find her most attractive or find her very, very beautiful, that she's not a mirror image of um, himself. He, he, she doesn't resemble him. Now, uh, the family is in straightened circumstances. There are financial troubles looming for the family. They have to cut down their expenses. They have to, uh, you know, do away with some of the luxuries that they have been quite used to. So what do they think? What are their plans to cut down uh, their financial expenses? Number one is they have planned not to bring any present down to Anne, as had been the yearly custom when they returned from London back to the countryside where they have their estate, the Kellynch Hall. So they decide that they're going to do away with that gift for Anne. And Anne is never considered by others as having any interest in the question. So I will explain what that statement means. Uh, Anne is never invited to offer her own comments about um, the financial situation in which the family finds itself. Her opinions doesn't matter. She is not asked to contribute um, as to the strategies to manage the family's finances. So she is literally and metaphorically marginalized in the family. So these details tell you uh, uh, something about Anne's place, Anne's place slash position in the family. However, the third person narrator states that Anne with an elegance of mind and sweetness of character which must have placed her high with any people of real understanding was nobody with either father or sister. Her word had no weight. Her convenience was always to give way. She was only Anne. This excerpt about Anne Elliot is very popular um, in persuasion. This is a much quoted uh, excerpt in the novel. And while the narrator is appreciating Anne in terms of her elegance, in terms of her superiority of mind, we can also sense that the narrator is criticizing the inferiority of mind of the father Elliot and uh, the daughter Elizabeth Elliot for ignoring her, for marginalizing her. So uh, if you look at the except quite closely, we can see that Anne is, uh, has a sweet disposition. She's uh, elegant of mind and 
at the same time the narrator tells us that the father or sister uh, and the father or sister is obviously um, so Walter Elliot or uh, Elizabeth Elliot um, they are people of no real understanding so that is also recorded by the third person narrator in this particular excerpt the word of Anne had no weight with the father or sister her convenience was always to give precedence give way literally make way and metaphorically give precedence to the others in the family she was only Anne she doesn't matter so this excerpt um, this narrative praises Anne as well as criticizes the others for not appreciating Anne Elliot the narrator now introduces another very significant character a very important character who has played an influential role in Anne's past and that character is Lady Russell she had a cultivated mind and was generally speaking rational and consistent but she had prejudices on the side of ancestry she had a value for rank and consequence which blinded her a little to the faults of those who possessed them so this excerpt describes the nature of Lady Russell and the narrator says that she had a cultivated mind a sophisticated mind and she was generally speaking on the whole quite rational and consistent in her behavior but she was prejudiced towards the nobility people of high rank and uh, she was also therefore blinded to the faults of such people who belong to the higher ranks in society so she was partial towards um, family of rank so that is her fault now uh, as I mentioned before the Kellynch Hall is the ancestral family home of the Elliots the property has been handed down to the next heir the next Elliot heir and at the moment when the novel begins we can sense that Sir Walter has failed as the head of the household in the sense that he is not able to manage the finances of the family so uh, there is a lot of financial mismanagement and extravagance on the part of the Elliot uh, family who are now occupying the Kellynch Hall and as a result they have to do something to uh, mend matters and what are the possible solutions and the best uh, solution seems to be to remove the family from Kellynch Hall they have to quit the family home and move house they have to move to a different place of residence either within the country or outside of the uh, countryside and this is what sets the ball rolling in terms of narrative progression so uh, there seems to be a stalemate and this move uh, of the Elliot family uh, from the family estate will uh, bring in fresh impetus to the plot and it will um, you know take the plot to places and, and introduce uh, more characters which will uh, create complications and resolutions in terms of Anne's uh, life what does the Kellynch Hall symbolize the Kellynch Hall symbolizes class rigidity in fact the narrator says that um, Kellynch Hall has a respectability in itself which cannot be affected by these uh, reductions uh, if you want to pinpoint and um, find out whose consciousness is this particular statement from it is from uh, Lady Russell who has been uh, called in to help the family in terms of working out a plan which will uh, stem the financial problems and Lady Russell has a list of um, uh, strategies to cut down the expenses of the family and she has um, you know uh, received the suggestions uh, from Anne Elliot too so she is very friendly with Anne and she has uh, asked Anne to help her uh, in forming a, a, a list of um, uh, suggestions to manage the family finances and therefore um, it is her consciousness which has uh, this 
this comment to make. She says that Kellynch Hall has a respectability. There, there is a lot of dignity to this hall, to this home, to this country estate, which cannot be affected by these reductions of expenses. It cannot be affected by the reduction of a couple of servants, a couple of carriages, and a couple of dinner parties. So uh, the hall will not lose its respectability, even if you uh, reduce its budget. Nina Auerbach, a very famous um, critic, suggests that Sir Walter's identity is inseparable from his title, from his crest, above all from Kellynch Hall. He is identified with the apparatus and accoutrements that encompass him. This criticism is very interesting because it does uh, offer an interesting comparison. Nina Auerbach suggests that Kellynch Hall represents, symbolizes, stands for Sir Walter Elliot himself. That is the point that she is trying to uh, get across when she says that he is identified with the apparatus and accoutrements that encompass him. He is inseparable from the title, from his crest, um, from that symbolic uh, image and above all from hall. So he is kind of you know intermingled um, uh, with the hall itself. His identity is uh, inseparable from it. Sir Walter Elliot comments on the Navy. Why? Because um, the Navy or men from the Navy are introduced uh, in the novel as being interested in becoming tenants of Sir uh, Walter Elliot. So finally the family has decided to let the hall and move to a different place and who are the potential tenants and Mr. Shepherd, um, the advocate who uh, helps Lady Russell in um, bringing down the family expenses suggests that um, you know the Navy has uh, rich men who could uh, easily occupy and maintain the dignity of Kellynch uh, Hall. But Sir Walter Elliot is prejudiced against the uh, Navy, naval men. And this is the reason for that. First, as being the means of bringing persons of obscure birth into undue distinction and raising men to honors which their fathers and grandfathers never dreamt of. And secondly, as it cuts up a man's youth and vigor most horribly, a sailor grows old sooner than any man. So he, there are two reasons for Sir Walter to uh, not like the Navy. Number one, he believes that the Navy will raise the importance of inferior people. So persons of obscure birth, socially inferior men would be raised to distinction in the Navy. The Navy offers that kind of possibility. There is social mobility, there is social climbing that has been made possible in this profession and therefore he doesn't like it. Number two. He says that the Navy is bad for a man's youth. Men will easily lose their personal attractiveness if they um, spend quite a bit of time in this profession. He says that a sailor grows old sooner than any other man. Uh, so this is his opinion. Men whose fathers and grandfathers were uh, from really lower positions in society will reach uh, really high uh, positions in society, especially perhaps uh, uh, in terms of fortune, and they will become unattractive if they are in the profession for a long time. This comment is very, very ironic uh, because we will see uh, that a sailor doesn't grow uh, very un unattractive. In fact, the hero of this novel, uh, Frederick Wentworth, uh, who has spent quite a bit of time in the naval profession, retains his uh, physical attractiveness um, throughout, uh, all along, and he somehow uh, rejects this claim uh, of Sir Walter Elliot. 
However, one other uh, objection that uh, Walter Elliott had to the Navy that it will raise uh, men to honors which their fathers and grandfathers never dreamt of, that is proved true because uh, Frederick Wentworth um, is from a socially inferior position, uh, but he has gained a lot of distinction by his personal merit and labor. Thank you for watching. I'll continue in the next session.